Hi, this is Miles at Inner Urban Era. I've had a lot of questions about model making, model railroading, and trains over on Patreon, and today I want to share some of my answers to those questions. Let's get started. Scarlet's Trains asks, when working with brass, how do you go about making changes? Simple stuff like replacing parts that may or may not be made anymore, or more complicated stuff like kit bashing. So Scarlet, the most important thing about kit bashing in brass is that you have to understand that each and every one of these is handmade. And so with that in mind, you have to realize that each and every one is unique, and so when you're trying to repair these things or kit bash them, you have to be really careful. Even if you plan to do a really hardcore kit bash, just make sure that you're doing so with respect to the original model. Now, what does that mean? You're able to approach disassembling these two ways. Most of them are held together with tiny little screws. If you need to get farther than that, you use a little butane torch, and you can melt the solder off on, say, a cab to remove it, or be able to take the front smoke box off. And then once you want to put the parts back on, as far as reattaching, you'll probably need something like a resistant soldering station. They're not cheap. I think they're in the hundreds of dollars, but it's something you can do. Otherwise, I would suggest you use barge cement to hold parts together or you can use CA glue, as long as you don't touch the model too much, because CA is brittle, and if you handle it too much, it'll just fall off, which will look terrible, especially if you've already painted the model. But those would be my main suggestions on how to modify brass. Shirokami asks, do you think 3D printing will play a bigger role in modeling in the future? Not just for props, but for rolling stock as well, to make the hobby more accessible and easier for newcomers. I would say the most important thing about that is that if you're a newcomer to the hobby, this may be a difficult path to begin with. You probably shouldn't start 3D printing models yourself, but going out and reaching out to a Shapeways or a Circus City decals for various printed operations to save you the trouble of having to learn both a 3D rendering program and how to 3D print things. Now, you can also download or commission people to build 3D models for you to be able to get whatever model you want into a physical realm and then you hire somebody to print them. Now, once you've gained more modeling experience, both three-dimensional modeling and physical modeling experience, you can parlay that into doing them yourself. It takes a lot of patience and just keep in mind that the time that it takes to design the model in 3D and set up the printer, have it print for many hours, and then clean up the, st the uh, machine itself is time all the way from physically modeling and working with your trains. So being able to push that work onto somebody else will be very valuable in making sure that you continue to enjoy modeling and that you don't get frustrated with print failures or roadblocks in 3D modeling. Jay asks, What's the model you're most perplexed that no manufacturer is made in plastic? Not necessarily the one you want most, but the one that should be made most. And similarly, Tala asks, if there's one area in the model railroad industry that's been desperately ignored and you'd love to see more of, what is it? Personally, I wrote an article in Railroad Model Craftsman about this earlier this year, and it was entitled, A Plea for Small Steam. So I would say, more than anything, please, manufacturers in N, H, O, and O scale, make steam smaller than A282, please. Anything that can be branch line. Most of the average model railroaders layouts are small these days because apartments and homes are smaller than they once were. We can't have those basement empires filled with big boys and FEFs. So please, make smaller steam. My top recommendation would be to build the Baldwin Logging 282 Mikado and the Baldwin Logging 262 Prairie, both of which were built in the hundreds, if not the thousands, and various railroads festooned with railroad-specific details that I think would be a very fertile ground for being able to sell a wide variety of models. The other thing is that many of those locomotives survive today in tourist or, or restoration operations around the country, so it would have a very good amount of sales to be able to plop them in a gift shop at any one of those little tourist railroads and make bank. Because let's be honest, most of the things made in those little gift shops are not direct representations of what you're riding, and that's a real pain, honestly, as somebody who's a rail fan who cares about that sort of thing. You know, going in and buying a random overseas train set that says Durango and Silverton on it, not really hitting the mark there. So I would say focus on Baldwin small logging mallets or logging Mikados and logging prairies. Matthew Disease asks, 
I want to have grass in my diorama slash model, but I'm not ready to go all in on static grass. What are some good substitutes or alternatives? This would be something for something small and not a whole layout. Well, Matthew, my go-to has always been Silfloor. They produce prairie grass and little grass tufts that you can buy in a little clear plastic box from Scenic Express. Those will allow you to pick off from the little plastic backing little uh, bits of grass or even just large swaths of grass that you can put on a diorama or a small layout. And you don't have to buy a static grass applicator or fight with it or have to learn any of that. It's already done, the grass is already grown, if you will, and they're ready to place with a little bit of glue. Ian Cole asks, what's your best advice for someone who's having a hard time getting over the mental hurdle of layout planning? Having a hard time putting together a plan that will have the operations I want while being manageable to build. Well, Ian, the most important thing I can impress upon this is to get trains running as soon as possible. Even if that means setting some Cato Unitrack on a dining room table or on the floor and getting those trains running as soon as possible because a lot of model railroad concepts die in the armchair before you can even have a chance to enjoy that beautiful giant empire that you've been planning for an endless amount of years fussing over switches and placement of structures and all that sort of thing. Get to the real as quickly as possible, even if that means buying all the track you think you need and setting up the tables and setting up all the layout elements that you want in person because you'll have to fiddle with that and refine that. And some of your most brilliant ideas will come through fiddling with it. No plan survives the moment of battle. So make sure to think of all of your plans as a general guide, a vague direction that you want to go, and further refine it in person as you go along. The Alta 2 is a perfect example of that. I ripped down the Alta 1 because I had track issues and it wasn't satisfying me operationally, so I redesigned it and came up with the Alta 2. And it solves a lot of the problems that the original layout had. And I fearlessly did that because I knew that model railroading is an iterative art. You know, it's a four-dimensional art, which also means it goes through time. So nothing has to be precious. Always iterate, always refine. Joe Mueller asks, do you have any tips for using the space between major scenic elements? Things that are quick to model. It's always been a challenge to make those between spaces feel right, so I'd appreciate your input. So one of the most important things is having an area for your eyes to rest between large scenes. In real life, the railroad swath that cuts through all the towns in the, ra in the railroad world has liminal spaces. And if you've seen the Instagram little spaces, you kind of have an idea. A long barren hallway, a line of trees, an empty highway. Think about how you want to model those spaces in between because they're almost more valuable than the scenes that are going to capture your eye because they allow that transition. Some of my favorite things to do are to put a river that runs either alongside or bisects it. You can also have a short line or a level crossing or even a uh, grade separated crossing with highways or railways that allow to add some scenic interest and allow an ability to see a larger world to show infrastructure that you normally wouldn't. How about a channelized river or even a highway that paces the railway that you're doing? I think all of these are opportunities to bend your, uh, your layout and extend it beyond just the station and the town and the thing. Have a line of trees that the trains disappear behind. It's all useful stuff. Modeling the liminal is very important. Adam Palmer asks, how did you discover Mexican railroads? And similarly, Sakuya asks, why the California-Mexico border region for your layout? I discovered Mexican railroads, it turns out, I re only recently realized through a Pentrex video. Uh, there was a pre a very generous over 10 minute preview at the beginning of one of the Pentrex videos I was given as a child, probably as a toddler, and I used to watch it all the time. And one of them is the railroads of northern Mexico, amazingly, on the Ferrocarril Pacifico. And doing some digitization of the VHS tape reminded me that that was on there. And I think so it was implanted from my brain at a young age, so it's always kind of been in the background while I've modeled California most of my life. And so it's provided a passion to finally return to it and then officially model Mexico, which I've found to be quite an amazingly intense and wonderful process to model scratch-built buildings, kit-bashed rolling stock, and really evoke a sense of place, which has been a blast. Finally, Christian McFunky Pants asks, 
do you ever just drive around to do missions like a kid playing with toys? Or is 99% of your hobby time spent crafting, painting, etc.? What is the ratio of your time spent building to playing with what you made? Well, while I can't give a direct ratio, I'd probably say 80% building and 20% playing with the trains. I'd love to increase that towards playing with the trains more, but as my layout gets more closer to completion, I suspect that will happen. But I also have a long road to go with a lot of scratch built buildings I need to build and a lot of kit bashed rolling stock I want to build. So a lot of my fun comes from doing that, bringing completely unique models to life. As far as the missions and stuff, I love that idea. I think that's a happy middle between the more uh, in intense and draconian, you know, timetable and train order and waybill sort of way of operating layouts as, you know, uh, the Tony Thompson side of the world does, where you're simulating a railroad, a railroad network which is totally incredibly fun, and I recommend doing it if you can get in on an op session where you can learn how to do it. However, the more kind of fun, loose idea of doing missions like it, uh, in one's imagination of going and taking a uh, string of freight cars and assembling a little local and then switching all the industries on your layout just for fun, absolutely, highly recommend it, and I think it's a fresh way to do it beyond just running a train in a circle or you know going from one end to the other. I, I love that idea, and I think more modelers should do that. So that's all the time we have today. Thank you so much for sending in your questions. If you would like to ask me a question, become a patron. And every quarter I will post these uh, Ask Me Anything sessions with the questions that you've asked. I look forward to answering each and every one of them. This has been Miles at Inner Urban Era. Thank you so much and have a great day.